It is a deed, an honor, and a pleasure to be with you. And today I'd like to speak to you on this very special day about social work, about some of the national and societal differences as it affects our profession, what some of our internal challenges are, what affects us externally in terms of what we do and how we do it, and at the very end, some brief thoughts about our future. It is very important to recognize that social work as a profession varies a lot. It varies from continent to continent, country to country, locality to locality, agency to agency. It varies in terms of our practices, how we're educated, the clients we serve. It also varies in terms of our theoretical orientation, and certainly it varies by how accepted we are by the people in our own countries and the people we serve. However, one thing is constant, and that is that we have basic core values, and the purpose of what we do remains the same no matter where we are. First, it's important to have a look at some of the basic definitions that are used for social work. The first is from the International Association of Social Work. And in general, it states that the practice of social work is both a practice and academic profession. It is used to promote social change, development in countries, empowerment of people, and the liberation of people and primarily it's there to enhance the well-being of everyone. The National Association of Social Work in the United States has a similar but slightly different definition because it focuses on service, social justice, dignity and worth of the individual, human relationships, integrity, and competence. There are common aspects in both of these definitions and while the international one has a greater focus and more emphasis on the global situation, and NESW United States is more on a national situation, both of them can be reduced to a single major concept. That concept is that the profession is aimed at reducing the risk associated with exclusion. As social workers, we are well aware that the national and societal differences certainly impacts social work. The model I'm presenting here is one that I developed with a colleague back in 2012. It looks at the continuum of regimes or governmental regimes from a liberal regime of capitalism to a social democratic regime of socialism. In the middle is conservative, that is, a, a regime that really doesn't go right or left stays pretty much in the middle, but makes some little changes one way or the other depending upon current economic and political situations. Social work then is in that middle ground that goes between those two types of regime. And that defines what the welfare state looks like. And then it plays out, as you can see on the bottom, in terms of services to either that are more individualistic, services that are more universal. And as I say, it tends to be pretty much in the middle, going back and forth with a mixed type of regime, which means there's some of both. The second model that's developed is typically a European model by S. Big Anderson. I'm sure most of you are well aware of this model. And it does a similar thing in terms of categorizing European models of the welfare state into three general types based upon the type of system it employs, uh, how it satisfies need, who pays for it, and what are the important scientific fields that sort of it's related to. And I don't need to explain that chart. I'm sure you're well aware of, uh, of that one, and I'd like to move on. But just remember, I'm looking at both of these charts as a way that influences how social work is practiced, practiced at both the national and local levels. So what do these two models tell us? Well, how do they inform us about social work? What do they say to us as a profession? What do they say to us in terms of our practice? What it says is that the conceptualization of welfare and assistance to individuals is different, and it depends upon the cultural, social, political system in which social work operates. 
Those systems further define the role and direction of us as a profession. So what I said earlier about exclusion means it's conceptualized and defined within the boundaries of a given society or nation state. Exclusion is not universal. It's related to the milieu and the social and economic system wherein exclusion is defined. Let us move now to take a look at what I call internal challenges or challenges that are within the profession and which are often debated by social workers and have been for many, many, many years. Now, the example I'm going to use will be drawn from U.S. situations and also from international social work, which I've engaged in for about 40 years. These internal challenges are becoming more and more salient uh, globally. Uh, there are certainly differences between countries and certainly in terms of the amount of existence. So they vary from place to place, but they're still there no matter where you are in the world. Social work is often trying to solve these internal differences by providing only two options. There's no middle ground often, and people argue about which side of that argument to be on and that there's only one solution. And consequently, there's been few resolutions of many of these arguments over the years. Uh, there's still internal challenges we're facing. The first internal challenge I'd like to speak about is what I call the difference between macro and micro social work. It's been around a long time and still is a major problem for us. If we look at the history of social work, we can see that early on, uh, social work began as a more micro, meso type of profession, working in poor communities, uh, assisting uh, new people who moved into cities during industrialization, but did put some political pressure on governments to change conditions. Later on, in the first part of the 20th century, there became much more social reform in the macro area, but at the same time, there was a growth in the medical and psychiatric sides of, of providing social work services in the micro area. So there was this bifurcation that was occurring even early on after social work was started. Academic institutions, for instance, universities and other higher educational institutions, started programs originally to train social workers in what was known in the United States as social service administration. So it was basically training social workers to provide services uh, that were provided in general by various levels of the government. In response, other academic institutions started training specifically at the micro level to work more with the individual clients. So was, there was the split between the macro and micro even in the academic institutions. Many training programs, however, started to provide both, both macro and micro. So students had the opportunity to choose between what might have been termed policy community organization or individual and family and small group practice. This resulted in our current present polarization of where do we focus social work systems on individuals or families? Do we do it with systems? Do we do it with individuals and families? Do we do that in practice? Do we train that academically? We're still trying to resolve that issue. The next internal challenge is the split between academic social work and practice of social work. Those on the practice side of this uh, polarization uh, state that the most important skills are developed, improved, maintained, uh, and applied while you're working directly with social problems in an agency. They state that social work is learned and practiced in the real world and does not occur in schools. Academics argue, however, that a profession requires academic training in theory, research, and broad non-agency specific learning with generalized skills that could be transferred to every social work situation. That social work cannot be practiced without theory and a science to underpin what you do and research to test it. 
that it's not a profession without academic training. The bridge seems to be that academic training, including a field practicum or internships, but the difficulties in the distribution of how much time is spent on the academic side, how much time is spent in the practice side, do we integrate those in terms of every other day, do we do it in terms of a block in the field and a block in the academics? Basically, students then seem to become runners, going back and forth, and they're left trying to determine the importance of each side of that argument. This uh, dichotomy, if you will, between the practice of BSW or MSW degree and an academic degree of the PhD, you begin to see that not only in Europe but in the United States. And it will be talked about a little bit later when I talk about uh, the identity of social work. In the U.S., there was an arc of a doctorate. That is, it started out by schools of social work providing a DSW, a Doctor of Social Work, which was primarily an advanced practice degree. That didn't suffice for the academic side and the science side, so many of those were converted to a PhD, and that's what we've had for many years, but now we're seeing the DSW come back as a practice degree, an advanced practice degree, because many people out in practice want to hold a doctorate. We also have professors of professional practice. They teach practice courses only at the BSW and MSW level, and they usually only hold the master's degree, but they're called professors of professional practice. There are differences in the reward system because if you're in practice, you're rewarded for client improvement, the number of cases you've closed, the number of clients you see, how supported you are by the community, that you've saved money, and that you're getting funding from usually governmental agencies. Whereas in academics, you're rewarded for creating and obtaining knowledge, extending science, getting publications, and obtaining grants and money. And once again, students are caught between these two reward systems. Do they focus on academics and grades and the importance of science? Or do they focus on learning the skills of practice and training? The last internal challenge I'll speak about is the identity crisis. It's sort of a continuation of the academic practice uh, disagreement. Uh, it will revolve sometimes around is social work a science, just kind of who are we. Academics clearly prefer that it be considered a science in order to be accepted in the pantheon of academic disciplines. One argument that social work is not a profession is that it doesn't have basic theory and science underpinning it. A counter argument is that medicine itself rests on theories derived from chemistry, physics, biology, etc., and not of its own. It borrows and uses these theories and facts from the basic sciences as it engages in a practice. It's called the practice of medicine, not the science of medicine. A major difference between medicine and social work, however, is that medicine was already within the university system well before the advent of what we know as modern science. Another question is, even within the university, what is the logical area or the place where social work should be located? Within the medical sciences or within the social sciences? Again, the identity of are we more working with individuals in terms of the medical model? Are we more working with groups as in the liberal and social sciences and sociology? It would seem, at least to me, that social work has taken sort of three major paths to try to solve what it calls itself as an identity problem and for recognition. One is to assume an identity of a social justice, that is, its morally and religious is importance. It set its identity in terms of the success of its work, in terms of outcome or a business model. And it set itself out to show that in terms of the evidence and the findings, that there is a science to social work. It seems to me, however, that social work operates in a myriad of welfare systems and can never be monolithic. 
It is really a profession molded into the context in which it must function, and consequently its identity and who it is is oft times molded by where it is practiced. I would now like to talk a little bit about what I see as external challenges to social work. That is, the things that are threatening to the profession from outside of the profession. And the first is what I call the, the challenge of everything moving to be a business rather than a service. Clearly, over the past decades, we have seen a major paradigm shift in that all things that happen in the world pretty much are framed as business and business entities and business work. We see business and social work agencies now where there's a monetary value placed on any outcome, where it limits activities to only those that produce money, where doing everything should be done in the least expensive way, where you regulate everything so that all activities are interchangeable, like an assembly line. One size fits all, but that means no size fits anyone. No individualization of services. And what that means is that social workers are totally interchangeable. It makes no difference. You can just put one part one in another place. And that means that social work themselves are just a cog in a wheel. And finally, to provide the average service in the shortest amount of time. That's the business model. Cheapest, shortest, quickest, least expensive. Individuals working in agencies and institutions are no longer individuals. They are seen as human resources. They are to be used and replaced and recycled just like any other resource. Case managers, not social workers. They manage the client to achieve a cost reduction. That's the new term for many social workers. Case manager, not social worker. So let's take a look now how business has affected academic social work. For example, in the United States, we'll talk about the loss of state support for programs. It used to be an average of around 70 or 80 percent of the money for universities and social work within universities with about 70 percent. Now state supporting universities is 30 percent or below. And that difference must be made up by us increasing tuition for students and making money from our businesses and research activities. That supports faculty, time, and salary. The universities are developing what are known as brands. They advertise their degree, they offer online opportunities, they compete for students, they lower admission standards, and they lower language requirements, all trying to get more students. They sell the program to students based upon beautiful living conditions, surroundings, athletic activities, and computers. Students now have become consumers, and universities compete to attract these consumers to their university. It's become, in many cases, a competition war to get students. This is also occurring globally. Universities compete in the worldwide market offering courses in English, competitive pricing for their degrees. Everywhere there's competition to increase revenue from students. Another external challenge is the challenge of socialism and capitalism. And they both can squeeze social work. As I told you earlier, uh, the social economic system that social work resides uh, has a great effect on what we're able to do and whether we're allowed to do it. If you remember in the first model I gave you, it showed that social work it was in the middle, that most of your social programs come when there's a mix of economy. So social work itself is only viable when there's a mix of capitalism and socialism, such that neither system shuts out the profession. If capitalism or socialism is pure, then either of those systems will develop policies and laws that preclude the existence 
of exclusion. At least politically speaking, there will be no exclusion because the systems don't allow exclusion. The one saying nobody's excluded, they can do what they want in capitalism and socialism. Nobody's excluded, everybody is included. So both of those systems have the potential to eliminate social work. As I said, social work, NGOs, other quasi-governmental systems provide the requisite assistance to those not adequately supported when they're in a mixed system. Constriction arising from either system threatens social work and can become a significant challenge to the profession. So as the systems move closer to full-blown capitalism or closer to full-blown socialism, it threatens social work as a profession. The next external challenge is what has been called datism. Datism is the result of the marriage of Darwin and Turing. Life scientists see organisms as biological algorithms. And since Turing, computer sciences have learned to engineer increasingly sophisticated electrical algorithms. That the same math laws applies to computer and biology. The barrier between humans and machines is gone or certainly going away. In datism, the economy is a mechanism for gathering data about the desires and abilities and turning this data into decisions. The supreme value of datism is information flow. Humans are merely tours to create the internet of all things. Humans will merge into the data system when everything is linked together. The chart on the left shows how many millions and billions of bits of data are occurring every 60 seconds. Human beings want to be part of that data flow and they give up your freedom to be a part. You're going to be a microchip in a giant system. If you merge with data, you feel good. You're now part of the universe. How do you know about your feelings, your attitudes, likes and dislikes? Google, Facebook, and Amazon algorithms already know those things. They know exactly how you feel, what you want, and other things about you you would never expect them to know. Does big data replace the need for social workers? It certainly seems like it might. The last external challenge to social work is populism plus authoritarianism. Dataism was the biggest challenge to social work, I thought, over the past 20 years. But recently, popular authoritarianism has become a much bigger threat. Populism is used as a mask for authoritarianism. As a result of societal and cultural changes, tipping points in terms of size of minorities, influence of women, shifts in power, have brought this forward. Social conservatives are feeling threatened. It creates fear about their personal, economic well-being, their power, their position, and of them becoming the minority. They become angry political activists, forming groups with others like me. This provides collective reassurance of their power, privilege, and status. These groups create the opposite of themselves into them. Women, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQ, and anyone they believe is responsible for taking away all of their rights power, work, dignity, and freedom. Them are to be excluded. Social work is also excluded because they assist those who are the greatest threat to populist authoritarianism. Populist authoritarian leaders and their followers promise to restore the nation, restrict immigration, take power from people not like them. Anything that brings to mind the old nation, the best of the past, restoring our dignity becomes the mantra of the populist authoritarian leader. A new truth 
emerges, a truth that's founded on fear and fueled by lies. The new truth is supported by discrediting any opposition to the leader's position, like fake news, counterculture, witch hunts. We will be great again like we were. We know these types of leaders from history. Hitler, Stalin, Mao. Similar leaders are emerging today. Social work over the past 120 years has not been a stranger to adversity. It has survived internal disagreements about the purpose of its work, who we work with, core values, methods, practice, education, science, and yes, even who we are. It has survived external threats, competing professions, doubts of our worth, severe economic disturbances, wars, and yes, even complete eradication by political systems. Every time social work has always reimagined, revised, and reinvented itself. Social work can never doubt its mission. It must always find a way to assist those who are excluded. This work is never finished. In my social work career of almost 60 years, social work has faced every challenge, those that are internal and those that are external. Yes, we will struggle with our identity argue about our methods, debate if we are a science, be concerned about what our profession is in the pantheons of professions, and indeed our place in the greater society. Yes, we will have to battle that the welfare of the person is more important than money, with the attempts to get rid of individual uniqueness and to keep the profession of social work to one of interacting human to human. Yes, we will have to recognize there are times when political systems arise and attempt to erase the need for social work. Remember, even when social work has been under siege, or even when it has been trying to be eliminated, it is always risen again. Risen again like the phoenix. Risen again to assume the banner and become the champion of those who are excluded. History is critically important to guide the profession as it continues into the future. However, solutions to problems will not be found by us old social workers. They will be discovered and implemented by young professional social workers like you to fit the ever-changing conditions where social work is practiced. Today we celebrate the birthday of social work in Hungary. Let us remember that history and the challenges that have been faced and focus not only on the past 30 years, but on the next 30 years when you all will solve those challenges I have presented today. Thank you and happy birthday.